There we go. Hopefully you can all see my presentation now. Um, hi everyone, I'm Charlotte. Um, I'll just do a brief introduction of me. So um, I'm Deputy Head at Wood Street Infants. Um, I'm also a full-time class teacher and I lead on learning outside the classroom. Um, so Wood Street Infants, so we're based in Guildford in Surrey. Uh, we're a one form entry infant school. Um, it's a really old Victorian building. We have no green space that's actually on our land. We have a wraparound playground. Um, but we have really learned to utilise what we've got really. Um, as Christine said, we're an LOTC Gold School and we also have the RHS School Gardens Level 4 as well, which we um, have used to progress our gardening as well. Um, so, this is kind of what our provision looks like normally. Um, so we've got designated spaces for Key Stage 1 and for early years. We've got a pond that we created on site ourselves. Um, and we've got loads of gardening um, opportunities as well, which we use throughout the entire school. Um, beyond the school, so this is not on our school site, uh, we're surrounded by woodland, which is amazing. Um, so you'll see the photo on the left, um, that's just a small fraction of the woodland that surrounds us. We actually don't have a school field that is part of our land. We have access to a school field beyond um, our perimeter, which we have a lease for, um, but it means that we have to deal with kind of other people using the field. Quite often we get dog, dog walkers during our PE lessons, all great fun. Um, so that's uh, just outside our gate. And then um, the photo on the right hand side is what we use as our designated base camp for our woodland school. Um, again, it's, it's not private land, it's public, Space. Um, we have a really great agreement with the local community, local council, so that we can use that space um, and utilise it as much as we can. Um, but again, we do still have to deal with members of the public and dogs and other people too. Um, but we've kind of got used to that over our time of doing learning outside the classroom. It's just part and parcel of what we do now. So, doing closure. Um, being a really small infant school, it was interesting. We've got a small, small staff team, um, equally small class sizes. Um, so we initially, we had our key worker bubble. Uh, we utilised being outside as much as we could to give those kids outdoor space, time to breathe, time to exercise and have some fun. Uh, we use an online application called Class Dojo for our communication. Um, because we're a small village school, we're a huge part of the community. So keeping that community, keeping our school ethos was a really, really important thing for us. Making sure our families all were okay, that we could touch in with them. Um, and I know as a teacher as well, I really, really relished in that, being able to still communicate with my kids. Um, so through that we were able to promote um, our outdoor learning experiences so um, all the home learning we set every day we set something that was in the outdoor um, environment as well um, we celebrated outdoor classroom day uh, the photo on the right is just a snapshot of some of the things that our families got up to um, we created a bingo for the day uh, quite a few children scored bingo too and got all the activities done and we shared all of those on our social medias and things um, we shared resources and ideas to continue our ethos. Um, we shared lots through our social media, through Class Dojo. Um, and also our head teacher created a challenge, which was brilliant. So this was her challenge. Um, she basically told the kids to create a new Wood Street logo um, anywhere that they were. And these were a few of the ones that were created. There were a few other examples as well that were indoors, but we were amazed at how many were outside at the beach, in the woods, um, out in their gardens, really showing that um, outdoor learning really is a huge part of our school community. So, when it came to reopening, um, we it was quite an interesting discussion for us. So we are an infant school, so the guidance was that we only actually had to open them for our early years classes. Um, when we looked at indoor space initially, um, we could see that we had really had space for around three bubbles for a real push. Um, and luckily, I'm not sure if it's luckily or unluckily, but we've got a small early years class this year. So we actually only had uh, 18 in our early years class. And when we did a survey to find out how many children were willing to come back, we ended up with 15. So our early years made one bubble. So it was amazing in that we were then able to invite back our year ones. Um, so we created two year one bubbles. Again, not everyone wanted to come back, so we just utilised those that wished to. Um, so we ended up with three bubbles with indoor space. When, as a leadership team, when we discussed kind of what we wanted for this time, it was a real focus on well-being and getting our school community back and just having some fun, maximising our outdoor space and really creating positive and memorable experiences. For some of our children in the area that we are in, a lot of them live in flats, 
um, don't have access to outdoor space unless it was in their hour of exercise a day. So for them, going from a school where they spend so much time outside and playing and exploring to being stuck inside for all that time, um, it was a real challenge. So we really wanted to make sure that they could get out and have some fun. Um, so when it came to coming back, um, we kind of wanted to continue with our normal provision. So when it comes to our outside spaces, um, we have mud kitchen, sand pits, water provision, um, deconstructed role play, our pond, all of those things that are just part and parcel of our normal school life. Um, so we made sure that everyone still had access to those. Um, early years had their own designated space, so they were fine, they were a bubble. And then um, for the two year one bubbles, we just carefully timetabled. Um, I'll talk a little bit more a little bit later on about some of the challenges of doing this and some of the things that we had to put in place. Um, I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of what, we, what we've been doing really. Um, we we looked for opportunities to uh, teach some of our core skills in the outside as well as we would do normally but we did still follow up with a reading writing maths based task at some point throughout the day um, our days were really flexible uh, we really went with what the kids wanted what the kids were capable of some days they come in and they needed to get out we needed to go and just explore and have some fun some days they just wanted to be in their outdoor space in the classroom playing with each other chatting re reinforcing those friendships again um so and again that's part that's kind of what we would normally do in our provision we run in a continued provision basis in uh reception year one and year two so our children always have access to free flow play throughout the day um and we just pull them in for groups and things so it's not too dissimilar to what we would have done um i guess normally the difference being that we had small bubbles um so we had to deal with our garden obviously because without managing that it would have gone uh, very wild so we utilized our year one bubbles to sort out our garden and um harvest our spring crop so with strawberries potatoes uh, we took cuttings of things and we also uh, run a, a grow cook eat scheme so every week our children cook um, not every child every week but in um in groups that in itself was a real challenge because we had all this crop that we really wanted to use and it was going to waste so we really had to think creatively about how we could still cook but still maintain that level of hygiene um, we ended up making cheese and spinach scones which is a photo on the end um, we basically went down the route of every child having a workstation we had to carefully timetable it so we had enough resources and equipment and things um, but it worked amazingly the kids were so happy they went and harvested their own spinach from the garden and they followed the instructions and were away with it and it was just a real testament to the skills that they had gained I guess over their time in school and then were able to use independently at their own workstation so it was really really fun massive smiles all around <laughs> um, being a community school um, part of a small village we also learned to appreciate really what was around us um, when we came back to school a few of our kids had said that uh, someone in the village had created a den so one day we went on an adventure to find it um, a few of the children knew the way and they led us down there um, you can see in the photo that the idea was is that you tied a ribbon um, to represent someone that you loved or missed on the den um, but we had so much fun playing down there we went down the first time had a little explore came back to school talked about it and then decided what ribbons we were going to take down who they were representing um, and went and visited a few more times since and i know so our year twos have recently come back to school um, and they've been doing the same this week and really really enjoying it it was such a lovely addition i guess from the community um, so I've been working at Wood Street for I think 10 years now, very long time, I've been teaching for 14 and I guess I've never really appreciated what was around the school. Um, it's really, really given us a chance to explore and take the kids on that mission with us as well. I'm, I'm quite an avid fan of the left right game. So we just go for a walk, someone says left or right and off we go. And in and amongst that, we found so many amazing places. Um, the field on the left just went on for miles and miles and miles. It brought such joy to the children just to be able to run as far as they could. 
Um, we found the railway line, which I guess we hadn't realised was quite as close as it was. Um, the bridge made a perfect place for some social distance waving. Um, so we took both year one bubbles up with us, one on one side of the bridge, one on the other. We had a nice two metre distance between and it was a great chance for us to chat and wave um, and just enjoy the outside. Um, and the end photo just shows really that no matter what, we are out and about. We just don our wellies and our waterproofs and we go off and have some fun. Um, that's our reception class. They went off puddle finding because it was pouring down with rain and they wanted to go and have some fun. Um, it's also a great chance to meet, I say new people, it's actually new animals. Um, so the dog is a dog called Ellie, who our reception class, every day reception go out for a walk in the morning. Um, they go on an adventure to find things, do things. Um, and every day they came across Ellie to the point that um, I think maybe two weeks ago, um, Ellie's owner stopped and the children asked her loads of questions. Uh, they had been looking at people who help us and people in the community, so it was a great learning experience. Um, they got to learn all about Ellie, how much she eats, how much she weighs, which was a fair amount. Um, we also discovered on one of our random walks that there were a plethora of birds. We had peacocks, peahens, um, we also discovered ostriches, all within walking distance from the school, which we never knew existed. So I guess, having the chance to go out and have that freedom to go and explore has really taught us a lot about our local community and what's there. Um, so, as I said, challenges. In a small school, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to staffing. Um, when we initially came up with our plan and our kind of wish to use our outside and continue with what we do normally, uh, one of the big things we had to think about was cleaning. Um, we basically came up with, we had uh, steamers, sprays, hose, and everything would just be cleaned in between. So it meant that um, our two year one bubbles had set sessions, we just cleaned in between, and we got the kids involved helping us with it as well. Um, it just became part and parcel of our day. Um, one of my big apprehensions about coming back was feeling segregated. It was so hard to decide who was in which bubble, who I would get to teach, who would be with my HLTA. It was such a hard decision um, and I didn't want to feel separate. So we ended up just doing lots of things together outside on the field. Um, we had designated areas in the field, so each bubble went a different direction on the field, but we were still able to chat, play, talk to each other, um, maintaining that two metre distance. Um, and I think by the end of it, we still felt like a class. We were still able to talk to each other, see each other, and it didn't feel like we were separate, separated. Um, when it comes to going outside, um, my HLTA led the other bubble. There was quite a bit of apprehension about going out and going out on your own. I think it's quite, um, it felt quite daunting, I guess, to take on that responsibility as an HLTA. So we ended up going down the route of we all went out together. We just kept a distance between both groups. Um, we both had separate first aid kits, those kind of things. Um, and it just took that pressure, I think, away from um, my HLTA. Um, getting ready to go off site, my goodness, was that hard work. Being that we're a small school, we only had access, so we had one girl's toilet, one boy's toilet. So going to the toilet took forever. But again, we just had to build it into our day, just make it happen, um, allow for those timings. Um, the same with hand washing, coming in, coming out. By the time we got into week two, I guess, the kids were so fluent at it. They'd walk in the door, wash their hands, and it just became part of our routine, part of our day. Um, as I said earlier, meeting other people off site, it's just the nature of where we are. We're in a village, there's so many people walking dogs, bike riding, and I will be honest, everyone was amazing. They were just so accommodating. People would just let us pass. The kids were so courteous and polite. We'd all stop and wait, and often people would let us pass first. Um, it was the same on the school field because um, quite a lot of people early on were still trying to find spaces for their daily exercise. We'd come across them on the school field, but we just, you know, it's a big enough space that we could be courteous and kind. Um, storing and handling our coats, wellies and waterproofs. So we have pegs in our corridors, but it's, it's a confined space, very little air, um, no windows. So we ended up just finding somewhere else to store them. We ended up storing them outside underneath our shelters, um, which in hindsight is probably the best place for them to be as opposed to on their pegs inside. Um, I think it's probably something that we'll look more at in the future. Um, 
because it's easier, e more easily accessible. Um, it also stopped kind of contamination, crossover of bubbles, those kind of things. Um, those were the real challenges we came across, I guess. I'm sure there is so much more that as we, as a staff talked um, and did things, other things changed. But um, I think the type of staff that we are, when things come up or when we come across problems, we quickly find a solution. Um, and I guess I take for granted that we don't always, I don't always have those in my head um, because we work so well. And I guess because outdoor learning is such a huge part of our school, um, we're so used to working in that way. Uh, so lastly, moving forward. So um, this is still very kind of up in the air, I guess. Um, there are still changes that I'm sure will be made. Uh, our plan, at the moment is that we will have a key stage one bubble and an early years bubble which means that our outdoor spaces will be much easier more easily used so key stage one will have their outside area we will have uh, early years will have their outside area and we will still use our outdoor space it, we will just utilize it as we have been um i guess since we've been work going outside um my plan really is to document and share what we do and get down our ideas because we as a staff it's in our heads we're so it's so innate in what we do and i think looking to the future of the school um having a record of what we do what works how we've kind of overcome these things is really important and also sharing them with other people as well um there's so much potential to learning outside that um yeah it, it would be a shame not to share it um and i guess finally just to really use the outdoors to enrich our curriculum and make the most of um what we can do out there that's me done. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> no, that, that was fantastic, Charlotte. Absolutely brilliant. A really comprehensive overview of what you've been doing. And there are um, quite a few questions. Um, but if we go to Lewis first, because um, I'm sure some of the questions will be applicable across, and Lewis will, might give a different um, perspective on what he's been doing. Um, but that's really helpful. And I do agree, write everything down. Otherwise, all that learning will go. Um, OK, Lewis. Um, those of you who just joined while Charlotte was talking, Lewis is from Kendall Primary School in Essex and LOTC Mark Gold School and he's going to talk through how they've been using learning outside the classroom to support their students during this time. Thank you Lewis. Lovely, thank you Justine. Uh, now I'm going to be using a Prezi presentation for this so I'm not going to share screen so hopefully I've gone big on your screen anyway because I'm speaking uh, and because you're on speaker view um and if that's right if you want to pin my video you can do and hopefully you should be able to see the presentation now on my screen okay so um as justin said my name's lewis i'm the deputy head kendall church of england primary school in colchester in essex we're a single form entry primary school and we've been on a journey um, of becoming a center of excellence for outdoor learning for the last five years since the the head teacher um she was the deputy head teacher she became the head teacher um i worked um under her as um a class teacher and then became the deputy and it's really been her vision and passion to drive us forward um the last five years and we've become a gold school um for the council of learning outside the classroom mark um and we also run outdoor learning training sessions for teachers throughout the year in a bid to get our you know, our teachers um trained up as well um, and obviously because we've embedded so much in the outdoor ethos for learning, uh, we knew that when we were coming back and reopening, we knew outdoor learning was going to be a central part of our provision and a central element also of our risk assessments as well. We know from research that outdoor activities decrease the risk of transmission allow more opportunities for social distancing uh, and also benefit the children in this holistic sense something that's you know more important than ever in these really difficult and trying times for our children um, and hopefully I'll be able to give you a few different ideas as we go through but some of the things that, that I we've been doing at Kendall um, and some of the things our children have been up to so first of all we had to uh, consider how we were going to get the children actually in to school, in and out of school safely. Our school building is quite small. The access road is very narrow. We don't have a school field. We were very concerned about large numbers of children and parents meeting in pinch points, drop off and pick up times. And our solution has been to use a local recreation ground, local park, um, to meet the children in the morning and drop them off again. So each of the bubbles has got their own tree over in the recreation ground. And each morning they meet with their teachers at the tree they're assigned at the beginning of school. And the children with their teachers take a short five minute walk across to um to the school 
Uh, this happens the same in the reverse at the end of the day. We drop the children off at their same tree so the parents can collect them. It means that parents can socially distance effectively. They don't have to mingle together. They can be, you know, at a distance. There's a large, wide, open um, field so they can see the children um, from wherever they are. Um, and it also gives the children a chance to catch up informally outside with their friends, with their teachers. It's a nice brisk walk to school in the morning as well. Um, and it also gives the parents the opportunity to briefly talk with teachers at the beginning and the end of the school day whilst keeping that social distance in an outdoor environment rather than being in a classroom in a closed environment. So protecting our staff as well as our parents. Timetabling has also been a consideration for us. Uh, we're lucky that although we don't have a school field, we have a large forest that um, is part of our site and part of next to our site that we use, a few hectares. Um, and we can easily accommodate all of our school at once in our forest um, to facilitate outdoor learning. We have to put in staggered break times and lunch times for bubbles, obviously. Um, and we've also zoned different parts of our playground and outdoor environment um, to ensure that children have access to the outdoors um, at, all, you know, at all times and in lots of different lessons. One of the first things we've thought about after we thought about how we're going to get our children actually into the building is about their well-being. So as educators we need to remember this is a difficult time for everyone including probably most of all children. Many of our children have experienced the sense of loss whether that be through losing family members, losing time or feeling a disconnect with others themselves and also their learning. And many children thrive on the routine structure and sense of the you know ex what's expected and children have experienced disruption in their lives and we need to we need to address that first and foremost most and rather than plow on with the curriculum and go back to a normal we need to understand that children need time to heal reacclimatize to their environment and settle into this so-called new normal that we've now all got ourselves into so learners and activities uh, which address pupil well-being were first first on the list for our children when returning and we all know um, that um, outdoor learning um, has great benefits the research tells us about children's well-being um, and their, their holistic um, sense of enrichment so lessons and activities address well-being um, because after months of isolation and staying inside for the majority of the time many of the children have also had this disconnect with nature we've got children who are coming back who have you know been very shielded very protected inside and not been outside for great amounts of time and even more so in this day and age have, have lost that connection with nature so outdoor learning really is a wind of opportunity for which children can reconnect with nature their peers uh, um, and address some of that imbalance which has been thrown up in, in their lives during this pandemic. And then moving on to our curriculum, our teachers now are very experienced in outdoor learning. We're doing it for some time as part of our ethos and it's the reason why many of our teachers say they first came to work at Kendall. We know from research and practice that outdoor learning increases the engagement of the children, it uh, reduces behaviour issues, it keeps children active and it makes learning and teaching more enjoyable. And coupled with the benefits of being outdoors during a global pandemic, outdoor learning really uh, today is a no-brainer. And you can see here in some of these quotes what some of our children think about it. Uh, LOTC makes everyone happy at our school. Even our teachers really enjoy it. Um, it takes my mind off things I'm sad about. It's great because you can see the sky. I love it. I like the sound of the birds. Uh, we're in the middle of um, Colchester Town Centre, really. Uh, we're very lucky to have this sort of tucked away woodland forest that we the children can access. And although we can here the roads in the distance is enough of a cut off from the hustle and bustle of the town uh, for the children to be able to uh, relax and, and, and connect with that nature as well as engage in their learning. So I'm going to have a look at a couple of lessons that we've done uh, recently. So uh, one of the most popular lessons to take outside at Kendall is maths. Uh, here you can see year two solving calculation problems using Numicon pegs and boards and then using lolly sticks to show which calculation is greater or smaller. Um, but because they had a larger space, the teacher reflected the children could spread out with their partners and they could solve those calculations. They didn't have to worry about if they were talking too noisily to their neighbours um, and disrupting other people. Um, and they were still doing the same sort of work that you might traditionally expect them to do at a table inside, sat next to a partner uh, and working through in that way. Art is also a favourite. You can see a pupil here has been doing some weaving in the forest using some wool and some sticks they've collected from our forest area as well. And we're also keen on teaching history in the outdoor environment. So you can see here children in year four constructing a Viking longship in our forest. Um, they're using teamwork, communication. They're using the historical knowledge and skills developed during forest schools to produce their ship, which they will then use as a stimulus for drama and story writing later on. 
Now, parents are naturally going to be concerned for the safety of their, their child during these very difficult times. Uh, we found that communication with our parents is, is key, really. It's been the fantastic way to give them the confidence they need to send their child back to school. Our head teacher writes weekly newsletters, uh, which is emailed to all parents and staff, it includes a weekly update of what each bubble has been up to, with photos of parents and other children to see. Um, and you can see there, one of the parents says, seeing the children learning outside in the weekly newsletter, is one of the main reasons I felt it was right to let my child go back to school. Uh, have a look at a couple of examples. This is a, a, a snippet I've taken out of one of the um, newsletters, and it talks about what bubble A and B have been learning. Um, and here you can see uh, the EYFS have been learning all about pirates, have been finding halves by drawing pirate ships in their playground, sharing objects between them, as well as using blue bots to find buried treasure and making pirate hats, and for the most part, utilizing their outdoor areas. Our head teacher also creates a weekly forest school diary, uh, which goes home as well, um, and is published on our website. All children at our school from foundation stage through to year six have forest school each and every week. Uh, they have half a day each. Um, and with our dedicated team, we're very lucky we employ four, uh, four forest school leaders. They're not LSAs, they're not teachers, they, they, they live in the forest um, and they work on a part-time basis to deliver forest school right from foundation all the way through to year six as well. Um, and here you can see some examples of a range of different aged children uh, creating art in their forest school sessions. There's loads and loads um, of forest school diaries and newsletters on our website. If you wanted to go and have a look at that, it's kendallprimary.co.uk and each week they're uploaded and, and they remain on there for parents to look at as well. So then thinking about supporting the children that are still at home, because currently we've got around half the number of children we would usually have back at school. Uh, in addition to our online learning, we've also set up a page on our website dedicated to signposting parents to further learning opportunities. And for those who are able to go outside, we also include many links to resources to get children and families to learning beyond the home. We encourage parents to send in pictures of their children learning at home, um, to share with the children in school who may not have seen their friends for several months now. Another big drive has been staff development. It's always been a priority at Kendall, as we know that we are a team and everyone in the team makes us stronger. Um, we regularly conduct staff surveys about outdoor learning, trying to better understand our teachers and our support staff's level of confidence and areas for further CPD. Um, because I think if your staff are not on the journey with you, then it's a false start. So, you know, it needs to be a school ethos for outdoor learning um, and your staff need to be behind it. Teaching in the outdoors is not the same set of skills as required for teaching in a classroom. And that needs to be recognised quite early on. Um, we hold many of our staff meetings outside and we dedicated our, one of our recent inset training days to developing outdoor learning across the foundation subjects, whereby all of our subject leaders um, led um, so for example, a history um, session where they spoke about how you and they did activities with the rest of the teachers about across the school, what you would do in history um, in the outdoor environment. And we really get our subject leaders to lead on their subjects through um, outdoor learning. So looking ahead and looking to the future, are we coming back? Obviously, we've got 210 children coming back in September. We're going to have bubbles of 30, so each class it will be a bubble. Um, and really in September, we're building on what we have learned during the reopening encouraging our teachers to take their learning outside the classroom as much as possible. Um, however, we need to remember that those children coming back to school for the first time since March will have had almost six months away from school. We may all now be used to the new normal, but for the children returning from lockdown, it is a whole new world. We need to plan to reorientate the children back into school life by focusing on their well-being and mental health before establishing the expectations of the curriculum. And we plan to do that with outdoor learning at the heart, really. We're also looking forward to reintroducing as many trips and visitors as possible, utilising outdoor spaces in the environment. We've already booked up our year six bikeability sessions in the autumn term and we have more visits planned thereafter. Um, we're hoping to have more visitors come into the school to develop our children's experience of outdoor learning from our year three Stone Age visitors, who you can see in the top left hand corner of those pictures, um, plucking some pigeons with some of the year three children in the Stone Age and also our Saxon warrior, um, you can see in the top right as well. So we can try and get trips and business happening as much as possible by utilising the, the outdoor environment. As I've said before, there are lots more um, things you can find on our website about trips and visits and, and how we do those sorts of things. Um, hopefully that's given you a bit of an overview of what we do at Kendall um, and some ideas uh, about things you might be able to, to steal and to use at your school as well. Okay.
Well, that's brilliant. Um, thank you ever so much, Lewis. And it's great to hear how you're, how going forward the role that outdoor learning is going to continue playing in the school. Because that's really important. I know. Hopefully, we won't have the situation like the last four months again. So um, it's really useful to see how you're using those learning um, come September. So brilliant. Thank you for such fantastic presentation, Charlotte and Lewis. And now I'm going to go through the questions. Um, we've got quite a few um, which centre around equipment and risk assessment. So we start with um, Charlotte. Um, you mentioned um, the equipment that the children use. To the school, I think um, Hamira is relating to the waterproof or clothing that children wear. Do the school provide these or is this something that parents provide? Uh, no, so it's part of our school uniform. Um, all children are expected, I guess, to, to come into school with wellies and waterproofs. We do, however, because we've been doing it so long, have a bank of spares um, that we can just use um, when we need to. Right. Uh, Jenny also asked about cleaning kit. So we, when you went through um, the cleaning, the materials that you do, does that include cleaning waterproofs as well? Uh, we hose them down and yeah, anti back them, yeah. Okay. Great. Um, then uh, there are quite a few around risk assessment. Um, what about the kind of dynamic risk assessment? So, you know, how, when you're doing spontaneous activities, how do you cope with the risk assessment? Um, such as your left and right game, Charlotte. If you haven't walked the route before, how, how do you deal with the risk on that? <laughs> is it spontaneous? You know, do you do it as you walk along, or is it something that actually you did know? roughly the area you were going to be walking through in advance and you were able to um I guess you I guess you're right it is it's a dynamic risk assessment um I guess what I didn't explain enough is that the space I I know where the space starts and the space ends so where where we are within that um I know I know the coordinates I know where we are roughly um I guess having a knowledge of the area and that confidence um a lot of the so what I didn't explain is that each of our bubbles also had a TA so there were two members of staff at all times um, and I'm lucky that the member of staff I was with lives in the village so I guess I say I say we don't know where we're going I always have an inkling <laughs> of where we're gonna head so if there's not as much risk as it would appear but to the kids they don't know that um, and it makes it much more of an adventure <laughs> yeah no that, that that's great and um, going out the this one is one that we've actually come across quite a few times at the Council for Learning Outside the Classroom. People getting in touch and saying, um, what, do, what can we do? Can we go off site or not? You know, what do the government guidelines say? Um, we always recommend people look at the national guidance, which is produced by the Outdoor Education Advisors Panel. That is updated daily, pretty much, with um, what the you know, interpretations of the guidance. The government can't, um, di you know, give tell you what to do in absolutely every single situation so national guidance steps in and supports you in providing interpreting the guidance for ad educational visit trips and off-site um, learning experiences so one of the questions was um about our local authorities said you couldn't go off-site because it would be neg neg negligent to go against government guidelines what we found from the learning outside the class and when we've come across this is it's different interpretations some local authorities have you know looked at and interpreted it in one way others have said well if you can walk there and you maintain you know, you have you you maintain um social distancing measures in accordance with government reg um, regulations then that's fine so it had varied which is one of the difficult things it had varied from different local authorities so some have taken quite a hard line. No, you once you're on site, you stay on school sites. And others have said, well, if you can walk there, you know, it, within a reasonable time frame. You know, if you're talking about an adjacent woodland or um, a, a a garden, um, a church garden, for example, or something like that, they're being open to that. Is that what you found, Charlotte and Lewis? Yeah, and I think to be honest, it would be more detrimental for us not to use the space around us because our site is so small. The experiences that we're then giving our children are so narrowed. Um, and I guess for us as a leadership team, we weighed up the benefits of taking that measured risk to go off site versus staying within our school grounds. And once we've done our risk assessment, it made sense to go off site and to get those experiences for the well-being of our children. And Lewis, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? 
Yeah, only that, um, I mean, we, we go off site um, every day because it's part of how we get the children in and out of school and lots of our bubbles already use um, off site locations for some of their teaching. Um, so the same recreation ground is sometimes used for PE and it's sometimes used um, for um, other maths activities or different lessons. So certainly at the moment, our, our risk assessment and our local authority enables us to go on local visits. That means um, without, have, without getting coaches or without having to get some sort of transport by, you know, if we can walk there and the venue is in the outdoors, then we're happy to go. That, that's sort of our, our policy at the moment. Yeah. And I think the government guidance is in September currently for non residential so you know in september we'll be back to full visits to museums etc etc um just not sleeping there yeah, yeah no, that's great um so yes yeah, we've actually got a webinar next week which is looking at a school um in islington who have worked with an outdoor provider to move off site to use spaces alongside the school site um because again it's a bit like charlotte's situation the school site didn't have a lot of outdoor space so if you like you can join that webinar and find out a little bit more about that um, so what happens if you have any children with special educational needs um, or disabilities within your group? Has that required additional planning or additional risk assessment or have they just been accommodated the same as every other child? Yeah, I think it's, it's very it's very specific to the child's needs, obviously, because lots of children will have different uh, needs. Some with um, disabilities may have um, a one to one support, which can make, um, you know, who can then make um, the adjustments as needed. I know lots of children who have additional needs don't. Uh, but certainly we've worked quite hard to ensure that the, the all of our the areas that we use, our outdoor areas, our forest is ac as accessible as possible um, to um, lots and lots of children and you know our teachers know their children very very well and are able to make those risk assessments to ensure that all children can access those environments yeah great um, Caroline has asked about using external providers has they, have either of you used external providers as part of your offer over the last few months no not at the moment no um, well, Caroline if you like that's exactly what we're going to be talking about next week um, next Tuesday next Wednesday sorry um, we've got a webinar which is exactly that situation so if you'd like to join that hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions there um, and then a few questions about how you deliver how you make sure you're delivering the curriculum through your outdoor learning I mean um, Lewis I think that you you touched on that a little bit more explicitly explicitly than Charlotte did but um, Charlotte you are still covering the curriculum through your outdoor learning aren't you yeah, I think I take for granted really, uh, as a school, we have a very, very cross curricular approach. Um, being an infant school with a kind of the curriculum is slightly different, obviously. Um, we have more freedom to cover things um, uh, in, in, in different ways, I guess. Um, as a school, that's just the way that we work. Um, and although it may appear like I'm very flippant and that we just do things how we want to do them, there is there is a really, really kind of deep understanding in our staff as to how to plan for these activities and how to maximise learning experiences. Um, yeah, there's a lot more behind it than I give it credit for, I guess. I, I think it, it does just show you have got a long experience. Sorry. Uh, yes, Lewis and um, Charlotte are completely embedded in your learning process, so it, it's second nature to you. You're not you're not starting from zero. I suppose it, it, it would be much more explicit and perhaps a little bit more structured until people have the confidence. Until your staff teams have the confidence to do it. Um, and someone asked about when you when do you think you'll be starting um, outdoor visits again? I think that's probably more you know kind of more structured visits. Do you think you'll be starting those in the autumn term? Uh, I'm not sure at the moment. Um, for us, I mean, local offsite visits, yes, that's part of what we do anyway. Moving beyond that, um, because of the area that we're in and uh, the way that we, tr the, the transport and things, it's something that we need to look at. Um, it's kind of on my agenda to look at kind of what we can do and what is within remit of our risk assessment. Great. Yeah, and we, um, we, 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 are, we are planning to have, um, going back to um, having visits and trips in the autumn term, um, so local museums, um, the local zoo, those sorts of places, we are, we are putting in place now um, plans that, um, and risk assessments to try and ensure, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic, 
We don't know if we're going to have a localized lockdown. We don't know if these places are still going to be open at the time. Um, but we are planning to, to do those. I um, was uh, I contacted um, Sea Life Centre in London the other day because we normally have a year six trip in November and we've put provisional booking in place. So we are we are planning as you know as much as possible to go back to and um, normal with our visits but in but put additional risk assessments in place as and when needed that that really 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 good from the wider kind of industry point of view that's really really good to hear um and um sorry uh, how do you clean your woodland areas or site um I mean, that is that, that quite different can't you get a hose and hose them all down so how do you ensure that the rock sites areas particularly more natural environments how they are Kind of compliant and able to be used continuously. I guess it's no different than when we would normally. We just make sure that we wash our hands when we come back, mm -hmm. discourage children from touching their faces, um, we have hand sanitizer with us all the time. Um, yeah, just general hygiene, I guess. Um, you're right, it's too far away for us to hose down and Mother Nature takes over. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a focus is more on rather than making sure the thing is clean it's making sure the individual yeah. is clean yeah <laughs> is that the same with you Lewis? Yeah, it is. I'd echo exactly what Charlotte said there. Um, we uh, have a big focus on um, washing of hands. So um, each bubble will have their own equipment when it comes to um, outdoor learning on the playground, um, and they keep that within their bubble. Um, but there are there's other. We've got an outdoor classroom. We've got um, a, the apparatus the children can use. We don't clean those down. They're they're wooden or they're rope or they're you know they're made of materials that are not going to be easily cleanable um, between bubbles. Um, so the importance is we teaching the children to make sure they wash their hands once they come back inside or before they eat on a regular basis. Um, the only exception is in forest schools at the moment, if children are using saws or they're using um, clippers or they're using tools basically where they don't or have gloves on or they're using gloves, then that equipment is either if cleaned if it can be between groups and if it can't be, it, we are um, isolating it for 72 hours until the next group can use it. So I hope that's giving people some um, kind of guidelines um, or advice on how to do overcome those issues. And there have been a couple of questions about, you know, obviously your staff teams are extremely confident um, and they've been doing this for quite some time. But how do you, tra do you offer particular training to your staff? Do they go in and do you have people come in and train them? Do you train them? How, how, do, you, how do you make them knowledgeable and confident to deliver learning outside the classroom? Uh, we've used a variety of kind of people that are out there. We're really lucky that we have Surrey Outdoor Learning and Development um, within our county who are amazing, most amazing training. They, they've done bespoke training for us. We've kind of teamed up with other schools um, and really tailored to what we need. Um, uh, Surrey Wildlife Trust offer training as well. I will say we're not forest school trained. And because of the size of our school, we've only got three teachers. So to have one of us for a school trained in terms of kind of the future of the school, it was a huge investment um, and it didn't really work for us. So we're not classed as a forest school. We run our own woodland sessions um, and we just use our own risk assessments, which we wrote alongside Surrey Outdoor Learning and Development. Um, we've used learning through landscapes, um, a whole host of kind of different things that are out there, I guess. Yeah. How about you, Lewis? Yeah, we're very similar. I mean, we we I mentioned we have four members of staff who are the forest school leaders. Um, they are all they're, two of them are level three trained, and the other two are level two trained. Although one of them is currently doing her level three, um, and that's by, uh, by the Essex Wildlife Trust. Uh, we've also used the Green Light Trust for um, staff development and staff training. Uh, and then we really just we develop our subject leaders in order to be able to train further down in our staff. So when as I was explaining the history leader will have oversight over what types of history are going on um, in the outdoors and then when we come to an in we we do dedicate a lot of our inset training and a lot of our staff meetings over to outdoor learning and the French leader or the English leader or the geography leader will take that session will plan it get the resources together take that session and then we'll have a discussion really about how we can um, adapt that for our year groups or our curriculum um, and we also have um, weekly uh, learning outside the classroom shares so one of our agenda items in our staff meeting every week is every teacher brings along um, a lesson that they have taught outside uh, and a little evaluation of what went well what didn't go so good and that's really to generate ideas and share ideas amongst the staff and then you get the more experienced staff being able to share with less experienced staff we've got two nqt starting in september and we've now got 
banks and banks of resources of how you could teach that lesson in year three in the outdoor environment. So rather than um, having a look at a picture of a, of a Viking longship and then getting another picture and labeling the parts, you could go out into the forest and you could build a replica. They'd still know what the parts were called, but they're doing it in a much more interactive um, and engaging way. I think that's really important to that. Um, I mean, there are lots and lots of training opportunities out there from organisations, as Charlotte mentioned, such as Learning Through Landscape, Council for Learning Outside the Classroom has some, um, you know, there are a range of opportunities. But I think as Lewis said there, just the sharing of knowledge between experienced staff and not new, well, not new staff, but staff new to learning outside the classroom, that kind of lesson sharing idea is a, is a really good, cheap, but free way um, of sharing knowledge and encouraging people um, you know, to develop their ideas and develop their confidence within that. That's a re really good tip there. Um, we've got one, a question from Cheryl about the emphasis on catch up maths and English, you know, where there is a kind of a, a strong focus on those being priority areas. And already um, I remember reading something that I think it's music, choir, drama, activities, etc. are already going to be you know, knocked off the curriculum come September for a while whilst there's a concentration on the kind of the key subject. So how are you going to make sure that a focus on outdoor learning is maintained within your school? I mean, Louis, you've already talked about it from the kind of health and wellbeing point of view, but as a general um, supporting delivery of the curriculum, how are you going to ensure that that continues when there's going to be a big drive towards the core subject? Yeah, I mean, obviously, obviously, one of our priorities is going to be to ensure those children have the emotional social they need before they can access learning really to begin with. Um, and outdoor learning delivers some of that. But really, I don't think it should be um, a tug of war between academic learning and uh, um, outdoor learning. I don't think that there's any evidence that suggests that um, learning inside a classroom gets better results. I don't think there should be this negotiation between what um, your pedagogy and outdoor learning is a, a type is a pedagogy. It's a way of delivering a curriculum. It's not a curriculum of its own. The national curriculum is the curriculum. Um, and we've certainly found and our staff have certainly found the national curriculum is 90 percent deliverable in the outdoor environment there are some things when you need to do geometric drawings when you need to use a protractor really really carefully you might be better sitting at a desk doing that that's perfectly acceptable but there are very few exceptions um, to the rule that actually most lessons can be taught outside and most of those lessons will be better for it. So I don't think there should be this argument between should we be outside or should we be doing maths and English. We do have to catch children up. We certainly do. They've, lots of them will have missed six months worth of learning. There are going to be gaps in their understanding and their knowledge. But I think learning outside the classroom as a pedagogy is one of the best ways to engage the children back with their learning and make that rapid catch up. It's very, very true. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Charlotte? Completely agree. Could not <laughs> agree more. Um, I would say, though, that I think um, outdoor learning is also an enrichment. It gives the children those first-hand experiences, especially in literacy, to write about, to kind of document. And, you know, it can be used as an amazing starter for a lesson um, and to really kind of inspire those skills. It's not just about the core skills, it's about having that creativity and, and excitement for those subjects. Yeah. That's great. Um, there's a question about um, external visitors. Um, so when you do start to use external providers, um, how will you, you know, either to deliver workshops in, to, your, to your school um, pupils, Will you be putting in any extra measures that you expect, expect them to follow? Will you be welcoming them back onto the school site? And also, um, this is kind of linked to um, educational, you know, off-site visits, but will you start to use external providers? Um, what, can, oh, sorry, so what can external providers be telling schools to entice them back to their outdoor spaces? So, you know, how can we support the wider industry to get help them get up and running what would schools say Charlotte is there um, I guess just be um, clear and explicit about what they're going to offer as well, because it's all very well and good. I, I mean, different schools will have different risk assessments. They've got different spaces. They've got different um, procedures. And I guess for people wanting to come on site, they need to be clear about um, what their expectations are in terms of their own risk assessments and having those dialogues with um, schools to make it work. Um, I mean, I know we're booking drama workshops in September um, to get our kids engaged and excited again. Um, and it's just kind of thinking about 
who those adults are in contact with, making sure we've got track and trace in place, all of those kind of logistics, I guess. Lewis? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think most schools are, are, are quite keen to get back um, to, you know, lots of schools understand the impact and the, um, the benefit of having outdoor providers both coming into our schools and in that sense just like Charlotte said we want to know that they have their own risk assessments um, and they they understand our procedures um, and they can accommodate our procedures as well because from uh, working with lots of different schools within our cluster of schools there um, some different schools are approaching um, the, the lockdown in very very different ways and have different procedures that work best for them locally and that's quite right so I think um, providers need to show that they are uh, adaptable and flexible and, and will work within a school's um, you know the situation and what they're doing but certainly I think um, um, providers where children would go to them like a, a zoo a museum a farm those sorts of places I think as long as they can show that they have put measures in place um, and uh, an element can be taught outside you know physically outside um, then I don't I don't see a reason why schools would be um, hesitant in going back to those providers we're certainly looking at our local providers and we've got culture the zoo very very close to us and we're looking at the moment as um, how we can organize um, a, vi a visit there you know being in the outdoors and we just want that reassurance really that uh, they're putting things in place to keep our staff safe and our children as well no, that's a good point. This is um, Louise Edward from Surrey Outdoor Learning and Development who spoke on Tuesday. She said the same, the, how they developed their relationship with schools and encouraged schools to keep using their services or to mirror the um, procedures that the schools had in place. So rather than the children having to learn a whole new set of, oh, this is, I'm in here and I've got to now do this, it's mirroring that. It meant the transition for the children was so much smoother, the school was much more confident because they knew that their risk assessments were being followed and their policies and procedures were being followed. So they, that's how a Surrey Outdoor Learning Development um, approached it. That might be quite good. You can find that. Um, Emily will include the link to that presentation in the email which goes out after this webinar. So you might like to use that. That will hopefully give you some, some ideas from how a learning provider has approached that. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, we've had loads of questions. Hopefully we've covered most of um, what people have asked and um, there were quite a lot there to go through. Um, Lewis and Charlotte, a few people have asked for contact details. Are you happy for people to get in touch? Are you happy for us to share your school email addresses? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah absolutely. no problem. That, that's great. Um, so please do, if you do have questions that you didn't feel that you wanted to raise here or things occur to you after the presentation, please do drop Charlotte or Lewis a line. They are absolutely fantastic ambassadors for learning outside the classroom. And um, I really wish I lived near one of their schools so my children could go there. Um, so I think you know, we'll draw the um, presentation to an end now. Thank you again to Lewis and Charlotte for a really fantastic insight into what you've been doing and how it's been working for you. So pleased that you know, the new practices that you've developed over the last few weeks are now going to be continued into the new year and your children will continue to thrive in the outdoor spaces. For um, everyone here, um, Council for Learning Outside the Classroom is a membership organisation. We have a lot of resources and support for you, so please do become a member. Um, as I mentioned before, both Lewis School and Charlotte are LOGC Mark School. That is a framework, a bit like ArtsMark, but it's for outdoor learning, for learning outside the classroom. And it gives schools the framework that they can work through to review what they're doing, address areas how they can develop and move forward, and embed learning outside the, outside the classroom throughout their whole school. So you can just see from those two presentations what an impact it can have on the children there and how it can make you much more resilient, especially in this new changed world. Once again, thank you so much, Charlotte and Lewis, and thank you everyone for, enjoy, for joining us. The um, presentation will be available on YouTube. We'll send a link around to everyone. And do let us know if you have any thoughts or any questions or anything you'd like to see in the future. Thank you.